as you saw earlier, and if you were on Facebook, you know that uh, I've been uh, uh, asked to speak today. And the thing that kept on coming to me was it's an actually simple word, but it's got some meat in it. You know how God is, right? The simplicity many times is the profound. Isn't it true? And it's called hidden in plain sight. That's what I wanted to share with you today. What's hidden in plain sight? You know, in Ephesians 4, uh, the Bible says, Awake those who sleep. <laughs> and Christ will give you light. <laughs> walk in wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Or literally, evil, according to theirs, means pressed and harassed by heavy labor. You know, we think evil is bad things. In a spiritual sense of the word, what's really evil is when you think you have to work for God's favor. When you think you have to work at being who you are. That's really the evil. The other stuff is almost incidental and many times just a consequence of not knowing that. You know, every generation has said the words that I'm about to say, and herein is the purpose of yours and my life, really. We are in a deluded age. God spoke to me seven years ago about the condition of evangelicalism, which is a sect of the larger, broader church, and our political climate saying, and this is a paraphrase of the Aramaic of 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 11, none of them receiving the reality of the new covenant by which we should live so God allowed the servants of deception to be dispatched so they would believe the lie they desire. I think there's a real truth to that. So as a result, the, the bride of Christ, I think, is going through some spiritual therapy at the moment. Um, and she, uh, she definitely uh, has had a challenge. I... I Evidently, yeah, our, our resident therapist is really enjoying that. But it's true, there is a delusion. And a lot of us know what that delusion is, in my opinion. Since the beginning, when mankind believed the lie that they were not like God enough, and by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would make them like God, each person and each generation has been given the choice to be the people of, their, of the egoistic fall, and that person that they are creating, or to function according to divine design in which they were created. This is why you're born. This is why you're here. Listen to me. This is why you're here right now. You were not destined for any other time but this. Amen. You are born into this physical world at this time, and more importantly, at this time, discovering the gospel of life in Jesus Christ. You're here today or watching even this video because you have been searching for your true selves. That search is what true freedom is. It really doesn't matter what occurred before. What matters is that you are here at this moment and it's not by accident. I'm not just talking about here at Oasis, but here in the search wherever you may be in the search. You know, we think freedom is many times um, uh, sitting in a restaurant and deciding between a hamburger or, you know, a salad. I had to look at my wife for the salad to remind me there. For a minute. <laughs> if not, I have to go home with her in here, you know. So, it, it, so between a hamburger and a salad, total vegetarian salad, how's that? Point being is that we think that is choice, but actually it's not. It's still running the egoistic program of what do I desire for me. Say, so, well, isn't a healthy choice a good choice? But see, the ego only makes choices for what's good for itself in the end. It's still egoistic. Understand something. It's not about good or bad. Say, so, well, isn't that good? But it's, good or bad is still within that system of good and evil.
We're talking about something outside of that system right now. This is why you're here. Everything from ordering food to religion and politics, no matter how it looks on the outside, is done from that egoistic fallen state. Whether it's good or bad, it's still in the same system. The Hebrew phrase, Nabal, you ever hear of Nabal? Well, it's a guy's name for most of us, but it's an actual f a word, a phrase, and in Isaiah 30, 14, which means the outer vessel. It's also translated in Proverbs 30, verse 32, as playing the fool or being egoistic. Now, the reason why I have our famous Superman here is because the disguise, or for our purposes, the outer shell is what God is inspiring us to take off and reveal who we really are. It's interesting that Proverbs 30, 32 says this, if you've played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you've planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. Now, more literally translated from the Hebrew, if you have fallen away in lifting yourself up egoistically and thought to do so, hand to mouth. If you've fallen away in lifting yourself up, egoistic, because that's what the fall is all about. It's me about me. And thought to do so, hand to mouth. Now, hand to mouth is interesting. That's all it says in the Hebrew because it has one of those two types of meanings to it. You could say, put your hand over your mouth, but also hand to mouth is a serving of yourself. See, it's all about the falling away is the ego being lifted up. That's why God's rigged the system that we need each other. That's why these type of what we call gatherings church, it's not something we can just easily dismiss because there's something about connection. And it's bigger than just those of us that are here in this room or watching on live stream right now. What it is, it's something way bigger. I kind of use this particular video because it just seemed to make sense. <laughs> it may look funny, but Jesus said where two or more gathered together, he would be revealed. I like the idea of Batman flapping Superman's cape as if he's flying. In other words, it takes the two of them. You may think that you, you thought, what? You thought he was trying to stop him. I, 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 what's that? Oh, Pastor Karen said, I thought he was trying to stop him. Do you really think Batman, by holding on the Superman's cape, can stop him from flying? Okay, we're really off topic now. Come back to here. Now, you may think that you're in a hard situation because the devil is against you or because you deserve the negativity that's going on, but I'm telling you, no. The Father God needs a manifestation of the Christ in the earth right now, and men and women of God, you're it. You are it. Yes, 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 yes. Ego says somebody else will do it. Or ego plays the part of the, what I call the ungodly trinity the, trinity, the me, myself, and I. But no, you are God's revelation of the Christ right now. There is nobody else. Humani whoever awakens takes off the shell which we'll talk about in a few minutes. You become the revelation of Christ. That's why you're here. But it takes more than just yourself to discover your true I am. This is why um, the I'm right, you're wrong approach only strengthens the naval, the, the outer shell, the ego. So how do I join in with God's Avengers or Justice League? That biblical name is the church. Amen. However, unfortunately, when we think of the church, when people say it, many times we do think about going to a building. Some of us get right and say, oh, it's the people. Eh, yeah, but even still, we treat it like going to a building. Oh, it's the gathering of people. Yeah, but then I think, well, that's the church, this 
showing up together somewhere. Church is more than that. First, it's a preposition and a verb, which means to be called out. Can you hear the calling? Can you hear the invitation? I'm not talking about getting saved and going to heaven. I'm talking about becoming who you are. Jesus said in John 16, 7 through 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Can you imagine that? If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Unfortunately, that's just been reduced down to an experience rather than what the experience is intended to produce. What does our outer shells, egos, and Jesus leaving have to do with us? We go to church. Uh, oops, wait, wait. Uh, we mean we go to gather together, but it's still something I'm attending rather than its true meaning. We worship by telling Jesus how great he is for taking the beating we deserved. We praise the Father for loving us by brutalizing his son rather than us. Basically, we've left Christ's and the Father's intention for us and this generation of our time. But there are people all over the world like us today who desire more than just to be right or another religious system. It's such people that are the sparks of the revelation of God and what he desires to reveal of himself in the world. Especially to those who are hurting, those that are hungry. And I don't just mean physically, but also spiritually. So how does the helper come? How does the spirit of the Father be revealed in our lives? All of us probably know the answer to this question. But for some reason, I felt God really say we need to state it as we are looking for those of you who are watching on video live stream or whatever maybe you'll see this later on uh, in several weeks from now it's Christmas time here and as we approach Christmas we, we many times fall into the pattern of doing actually the, the life giving things but because it's the holiday season and not because this is the way we should be all the time I'd like to read a section of scripture to you. This is in Luke 24, 13 through 31. You would think, as my, my wife said uh, yesterday, as I, she asked me, you know, what's the title of your message? And I gave it to her, and she said, tell me a little bit about it. So I started to share. She goes, interesting. An Easter event for Christmas. And if you think about it, that works. Because it's always about the coming of the kingdom, the coming of the Christ, the announcement. It says in Luke 24, 13 through 31, Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. I'm telling you, that verse alone you could preach about for a while. I mean, that all the symbols there of Emmaus. Seven, the number seven, miles from Jerusalem. Pretty powerful stuff, but I need to keep moving. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, I bolded this on purpose. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have, not, and have you not known the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. 
Notice they had an expectation, and he didn't fulfill their expectation, or at least not in the way they thought. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Yes, and certain women, check this out, certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Bold it again. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, in all, the in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, for the day is far spent. And he went in to, to stay with them. And it came to pass that as he sat at the table with them, and he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And it's that last sentence will be the key. Their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. My question's always been, if they figured it out, how come he vanished? Glad you asked. The road to Emmaus, the word Emmaus comes from the Hebrew word chamat. Chamat is used about 127 times in the Old Testament, and it refers to a, the burning sensation from a snake bite. It's sometimes translated anger as well. I should tell you something about anger. Why? Because anger's source is ego, or the serpent himself, if you want to put it that way. The key is this. It hearkens, Emmaus, Hamat hearkens to the story where Moses, after the people have been bitten by serpents, do you remember this? He takes what they call a brazen or like a bronze serpent. He takes a serpent and pales it on a staff and holds it up. And when the people look on that serpent, they're healed. Do you remember that? Well, you may be familiar with this because this appears in many ways and are still in our culture today representing the medical community. Let's break this down. When the fall occurred, the form of the serpent changed from being in the tree, coiled, to now on the ground, flat. Now, there's a whole lot of things to do that. And if you've been through Genesis Factor, you know about time, how time's changed, all this kind of stuff as a result of that transformation. But in the simplistic sense, in that section that Jesus refers to regarding Moses, there are two things. Number one, the serpent is impaled on a stake or a tree. Jesus will refer to this in the gospel when he talks about him, like Moses and the serpent, would be lifted up. Second is the serpent from the ground being lift up implies this. Remember, the serpent is the spiritual quality of egoism, self-centeredness, me, myself, and I. So the issue is the serpent on the ground is the ego in its base nature. When we lift it up, we are transforming the ego from the base nature and putting it back, if you will, to its original intent, which I'll talk about in a moment. Let's use another phrase for ego. The desire to receive for it oneself alone. That's another definition. That's a biblical definition. The Hebrew word is ratzon. That's, that's what this is. 
When the ego, when we, we transform the desire to receive for ourselves into the desire to receive and reflect or receive and give, all of a sudden things change. By Jesus suffering, the tyranny of the embodiment of both the religious and political system of his day and being put on a cross, he showed what a transformed ego looks like, and that's called compassion. Does that make sense? Now, with that in mind, the reason the disciples didn't recognize this, the same fellow they've been around for quite a while was because of the egoistic reason. Let me show you what the Aramaic translates Luke, uh, was it 23 or 24, 25. Then Jesus said to them, ah, the inflated egos and heavy-weighted hearts. Some translation says, you fools. Fool is not, I, not really a, a proper word there, although if you want to translate it, it uh, that way, you could. But the point is, if you think about it, Jesus spends all this time in the Beatitudes saying, if you call somebody a fool, you're, you're in danger of hellfire. Isn't, but you know how translators are? A lot of times it's a predilection to a, 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 a point of view. So then they have Jesus calling guys fools. Then he should be guilty of his own words then by him being in danger of hellfire. But that's not the case. He's pointing out something here. He's showing us something. He's showing them something. You've got an inflated ego. That, and he's, he's right there. But because of the inflated ego, they can't see him. You see, the resurrected Christ is a little bit different than the pre-crucified Christ. The pre-crucified Christ is, is the, the God in the man, if you will, who is trying to get us from one religious or worldly, political, all that stuff, because it's all connected, system to a different system. The kingdom of God. But that system kills that process. And rather than retaliating, hey, you're wrong for what you did to me. I got every right to lay it on you. Instead, he says, you go for it because you can't kill life. You can't kill life. You can't kill this kind of love. There's nothing you can do. Matter of fact, it's so powerful that once you stick nails in my hands, whip my body, do all that you do, I'll come back and show you. And it's not going to be na na nanny goat. See, I was right and you were wrong. Rather, I'm going to come back and show you you couldn't kill life. And with this life, the reason why I couldn't is because I didn't retaliate. I didn't get into right and wrong. What I got into was, what you did, yes, was unjust. But rather than pointing that out, I'm going to say, I forgive you. Peace. The war is over between us. Even though, consider this, he expounded on the scriptures. It says he started from Moses, which is the Torah. And we started going through all the scriptures. They still didn't see him. We do find that their hearts burned. Something was happening, but they still didn't see him. Instead, something else had to happen. And this minor adjustment is the difference between the serpent and and the Savior. That was kind of cool. They both started with letter S. It wasn't until their conversation became a caring one about this stranger's well-being. Can you imagine that? All of a sudden, it's nightfall. And they've been talking... I mean, they thought this stranger was kind of numb in his head because he didn't know anything about what the events that happened recently. And he turns around and says, you know, you let your egos get the best of you here. So he starts expounding the scriptures. 
But it wasn't until, and it says, if you go back and reread the verse, that Jesus was going to continue forward. But they constrained him. They decided and said, no, please don't go. It's nightfall, guy. You're going to be walking through the night. Why don't you come spend the evening with us? Let us feed you. And it literally calls out this phrase. They went to Cleopas' house. The Greek word Cleopas means invitation of the father. You see, it wasn't until they became caring about someone else that all of a sudden the sound of the invitation of the Father, they enter. In that moment, they didn't need to see Jesus in front of them. Something happened at this point. What happened was, by their act of altruism, by their act of giving, by their act of kindness, of love, of caring for another person, in the simplest sense, genuine sense, at this point it didn't matter how many scriptures they had memorized. I'm not saying that's not important. But I'm talking about how that's got to transform to knowing the Bible, to becoming. In that moment, Jesus breaks bread with him, and all of a sudden, it was like, ah, that's the guy. We, we've been talking. How did we not know this? Well, actually, it didn't happen that fast. It just, they saw him, they knew him, and they vanished. He vanished. He saw them. He, they saw him. They knew him. And he vanished. Why? Because it was no longer necessary for them to see the guy Jesus. Because in that moment, they became the guy. Jesus. You see, men and women of God, the serpent is crafty and constantly wants us to looking for a Jesus. He's got us either looking up at the clouds for him to come so we can be raptured away. I'm not debating these truths or possible truths. I'm talking about what's the key to the message. Jesus said, it's better that I go away. No, no, we, but we don't want Jesus to go away. We constantly rehearse about the guy external from us. We had draw pictures. All these things. And even then gets distorted sometimes. There's a reason why in the book of Revelation... When the angel came to talk to John about, about what is to come, John falls on his face and he says, get up, just get up. No, stop. There's a reason why that's not our posture. Falling on our face physically doesn't mean anything if we haven't taken the serpent in our heart of ego and selfishness and self-centeredness and believe me, the ego will be religious. What I mean by that, it'll go, it'll go to a thing called church. It may even attend prayer meeting. It may even tithe. All these things we should be doing. I'm not saying we shouldn't. My point is, though, is we do it for this. You may have heard me tell the story of a pastor friend of mine who got into a fundraising program, and he had the three different levels of the fundraising. You had the gold group, the silver group, and the bronze group. Bronze group gave $500, silver group gave $1,000, and of course the gold group gave $5,000. And, God bless him, most of the elders gave to gold, few to silver. 
And as a result, their names got put up on a wall. And then I remember about a year and a half later, him telling me that his elders were giving him such a challenge with this process. And he, and he was like, I don't understand. The devil must have got in them. And I was just gracious. But in my mind, I thought, but you taught them. You let their egos be gold, silver, or bronze. That their, in, their intention was mixed with having their name up on the wall. No, it's not about our names on the walls. It's not about tithing because it does something in our consciousness uh, and makes us feel good about ourselves. It's because we love. Give because you love. Some of us say, I give because I'm led because this voice told me. Uh, that's okay, but let me tell you something. By biblical definition, the voice, God is love. I don't care what voice you're hearing. If it's not sourced in love, it's not him, even if it's the right thing. And there's a whole lot of right going on in the name of Jesus right now, but his character isn't in it. Jesus himself said in, in Matthew 7, you cast out demons in my name, you perform miracles in my name, you prophesy in my name, but I don't know you. But to see Jesus, not there, here, was a simple act of, come to my house. Let me feed you, because I, I, I just care. Let me love on you today. Do we need to do this? Do we need to build that? It's fine. Let me, I just want to love it. I just want to love doing it. I'm excited about loving. Because now, if you want to see Jesus in the truest sense, you want to see the Christ in his most revealed hour at the moment, when that's the attitude of our heart, all you have to do is look in the mirror and you will see Christ revealed in this hour. You see, it's not about waiting for him to come in the clouds, though he may come that way. It's about his coming right now for this generation, for the, all the different ages of this, within this world at this time. It's now about his coming. Let's no longer take our attention and say, remember how the Bible said, don't go over there, don't go over here, saying that there's Christ. Jesus said that. He says, for as far as the east is from the west, when the coming of the Son of Man will be, you're going to know it. And we're still looking out. Oh, that means that way, east to west. Go back and rethink with me for a moment. Could it be what these men experienced, Clapus, the invitation of the Father? You know, these guys, right after the ha this happens, they get up and they... They take off to the disciples if you keep reading on. And when they get there, and it's very possible because it was two guys. One's name was Cleopas. The other guy, we don't know his name, but very possibly it's the name Simon. Because then the verse says that he revealed himself to Simon. It wasn't talking about Peter. We already know that Peter went to the tomb didn't get it. But I've even read some commentaries that refer to it that that's that Peter. Do you realize there are nine different Simons in the New Testament? possibly a tenth. Simon, in Hebrew, shamon means to hear. You see, it was about hearing the invitation of the Father through an act of kindness. If I can be bold, it's so simple, it's almost stupid. <laughs> to quote Veronica and Karen. <laughs> the prophetic word, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so simple. But it's in there where the Christ is revealed. It's through you, in our acts of kindness, in our giving, whether it's building churches or handing somebody a food or inviting them to your home, giving them a gift on Christmas. It doesn't matter. Giving them a ride to church, it doesn't matter. If it's done because you love, 
the Christ has been revealed. You don't have to wait for a physical healing, don't have to wait for a prophetic word or to hear some external voice to do it. If you think about it, in the process of maturity, according to the gospel, first John, the first epistle of John, hearing God is the most immature thing we can do. Because if you have to be told to do something, you haven't become anything yet. But when I don't have to be told and I can just emanate that love, that joy, that peace, and all of it, it's all there. You don't have to actually become, you, like Superman, need to unveil. Take the nival. Take the shell. Take that, another word is tzig, I believe, in, in, uh, in Hebrew. It's like the skin on, on a banana. It's like the skin on a banana that needs to be peeled. Or uh, another word that uh, appears, it's a derivative from the, oh, the Old Testament as well, klepot, the shell, the husk, like the husk of a corn. It comes off by being who you are, which is love in action. You are the love of God in this earth right now. And you don't have to look any further for a revelation, any higher than your own nose, if you will. Actually, you just need to look in the mirror into your heart. It's all there. It's been hidden in plain sight. Amen? Father, I thank you for these wonderful people. I thank you for the people watching right now. I thank you, Lord God, that while we've been looking for the power of God, which is fantastic, while we've been looking at end time situations and trying to read the circumstances of the time, Lord, while we've been trying to figure out which is right or wrong politically, while we're trying to figure out which is correct theology, the most correct thing, God, each one of us can ever have is be the revelation of Christ in the earth right now by transforming our ego from the ground and raising it back up high impaling that ego to now receiving to give that we will receive from God to pleasure him and then in turn share what he's given all of us from gifts, talents, finances, all those things to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.